However, if you see a record that has multiple holes in it, attorney's gonna go after you because you're gonna have to try to defend yourself after the fact and that never works. But your clinical record, if it's established, that will testify for you and lays a foundation and will protect you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Raving Patients podcast sponsored by the Doc Sites and Cloud Dentistry. I thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm really excited. I've been uh, trying to get this guest on for a very long time. He's super busy. Um, he's uh, wanted to be a speaker at a many, many, many uh, meetings around the country because of his experiences and unfortunate instances that took place in his life. Um, I met him at um, SEN, the Speakers Consulting Network meeting, um, a number of years ago. He was actually my liaison, my mentor. I was uh, there for my first year, and he helped me get through that, and uh, we've kept in touch since. Um, I want to welcome to the Raving Patients episode, uh, Roy Shelburne. Roy, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Lynn, thank you for having me. I appreciate the, uh, the offer. I appreciate being able to spend some time with you and with your raving patient attendees. Thank you. I actually saw you speak um, in Baltimore. Um, I was a, a sponsor at, at, um, at the CPA, Alan. Um, Alan Schiff had a meeting, and um, we ended up, uh, I ended up seeing you speak there. Um, so I, I know, I know your story or I know some of your story. Obviously we've been talking before we were doing the recording. Um, and, um, I learned a little bit more about it. So, um, to begin with, why don't you, and look, I, I hate to say this, but you kind of have to be living under a rock, not to know who you are and what you talk about. Your story is, is certainly extremely unique. Um, unfortunate to some extent, but, um, for those that don't know who you are or, or what happened to you. Can you spend a couple of minutes just talk about, you know, who you are, what you, what you went through and how you help uh, dental practices now? Thanks uh, for the question, Lynn. I, I grew up in the Western part of Virginia, um, graduated from dental school in 1981, set up my practice in my grandfather's hardware store building and practiced there with a smile on my face for 27 years. I'd flown to the American Dental Association meeting in 2003. It was in San Francisco, California. While I was there, my wife called me to let me know that the FBI had come to my office. They'd battered down my back door and were taking all my records. That sent me down a path that I never expected to go down. Learned a lot in the process. I was indicted three years later. Went to trial a year and a half after that. Was found guilty. The It was a jury trial. Had to be a jury trial. The jury is never made aware of the amount of the the amount that I got that I wasn't entitled to. And did we make mistakes? We absolutely did. The, the amount that I was paid over the six year period that they did the evaluation for was three and a half million dollars. And during sentencing, the prosecution established the amount I got of the three and a half million dollars was $17,899 and 57 cents. And we were able to go over the same period and identify work that I had done, could have billed for and should have billed for in the amount of about $30,000, but that made no difference. I thought 0.01% was a pretty good error percentage. The government did not. So there were things I learned in the process that you should do, could do to defend yourself. And basically, ignorance is no excuse. You can't say I didn't know. As far as mistakes, I, those were innocent mistakes from a legal standpoint. Intent to defraud includes... Issues, if you bill for something you never did on a patient you never saw, obviously that's fraudulent if you do it intentionally. But it also includes a broader definition, which is defined as blind disregard. So if you do things the same way and make similar mistakes and don't have a system to identify and correct those mistakes, that is considered intent to defraud and you can be held accountable. I thought if I'd made mistakes, I could give it back with any interest or penalties. I thought the $17,899, I could write a check and be done with it with any interest or penalties. The best offer I ever got to settle was three years in prison and a restitution of $300,000. So I learned the hard way that documentation, billing, and coding are exceedingly important and have now become passionate about sharing my story, what I've learned, and to teach dentists how to document and bill and code appropriately so that I'm the last dental professional who goes to prison for things they didn't know or understand. So that's the story in a nutshell, Dr. Lynn. Wow, that, that's incredible. Um, I have just a couple of quick questions on that. For people who are wondering, how long did you spend in jail, number one? And number two, 
Number two, do you think you were made an example of because of what happened to you? Question number one, I was sentenced to 24 months, sent 19 months in the federal prison and two months in a halfway house. In the federal system, the minimum amount of good time behavior, you have a reduction is 15%. And I was, I was given that. Um, actually going into sentencing, the low end of the sentencing guidelines was 15 years. And there were a lot of things, Lynn, that happened that were very providential in the process. The Supreme Court defined a single word on the money laundering statute. I was, I was charged not only with health care, but racketeering, money laundering, and structuring. And five of the counts were money laundering. So if you get money that is inappropriate and you put it into a legitimate account, my, my account for my office, and you pay legitimate bills using that account, you've laundered dirty money into um, clean money. That's definition of money laundering. And the Supreme Court didn't find a single word in that statute six days before I was to be sentenced. And my attorney read the findings and told me, he said, I think the way the Supreme Court has defined that, it no longer applies in your cases. And there were five charges of money laundering. So he wrote a motion to the judge asking the judge to set aside the money laundering convictions based on the Supreme Court decision that happened six days before. Going into sentencing, like I said, the minimum guidelines were 15 years. So that was the best I could hope for is 15 years. But the judge read and ruled on my attorney's motion to reduce or to remove the money laundering convictions based on that Supreme Court decision. The judge agreed. So that reduced the amount of time that the guidelines established to 47 months. And the judge actually reduced it to 24 months, which is unusual for them to do. And in his justification for that, he said that he felt that a decision could have gone either way. So he halved it basically. So six days before, so I was sentenced to 24 months, sent 19 in federal prison and two months in a halfway house. And what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. No worries. The second one was, do you think you were made an example of because of what occurred? Absolutely. Um, the prosecuting attorney, he did not directly prosecute my case, but did su supervise the prosecutor who did, um, ran for governor of Virginia based it based part of his platform on being tough on fraud and abuse in the in the um, Medicaid system. Um, he was elected. Do you believe in karma, Dr. Lynn? Yes, very much so. He was elected to two terms as governor of Virginia, and shortly after he finished his second term, he was indicted for inappropriate fund um, re recipient of funding. I think. Mine was $17,899.15. His was $18,000 that he got that he wasn't entitled to. He was found guilty and was sentenced to the same 24 months in prison. That's really funny. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. It is, it is kind of crazy. But that, like I said, things in life, I just look at and go, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, well, I think you obviously learned a lot from your experience. You now are, are um, sharing your expertise in the space um, with other dentists. So... Um, I wanted to, um, hit some of the key points that we wanted to bring up. So, you know, one of the things is, is, and we talked before in how, um, I evaluate some records from, from dentists in a number of different fashion now outside of what I do clinically, which is not much anymore. Um, but there are risks in dentistry that many do not appreciate or know about. So I wanted you to go over this because I think it's really important. You know, people think that, it, you know, running a business is, is, or do, being a dentist is hard. Running a business is even harder, and then having to obviously there's other risks that they need to know about. So I'm I'm, I'm really curious what you are going to talk about here. So basically, if you're providing care in a space that accepts reimbursement by a government entity of any kind, and most people think that's limited to Medicare and Medicaid, it is not limited to that area. It includes federal employees. It includes dependent of active duty military, it includes anybody who is covered under the Affordable Health Care Act. All of those, to some degree, are subsidized, paid, sometimes in full, sometimes in part, by government funds. If you receive government funding of any time, there is a seven-step compliance program that is mandated that you have in your practice. And as you shared, Lynn, I, I speak a lot. I'm all over the country, and I have people raise their hand first if they accept any of those types of payments for many, and almost everybody in the audience does. And my second question will, of you who 
do accept reimbursement in, of some kind by a government entity, how many of you have that seven-step compliance program implemented in your practice? And I've had three individuals raise their hand in three different sessions. And I always ask them, how did you come about establishing? How, how did you decide you needed to do this? And all three of them had an opportunity for the government to come in and do some kind of analysis, audit. It triggered some kind of issue with them. And that's the reason why they've learned. And just like HIPAA and OSHA, the business side, as you mentioned, in um, dentistry, in dental school, are we taught any of that? Almost nothing. And if it is, it's maybe a lunch and learn or maybe half a day. They're going to tell you a little bit. But are you held accountable for all those things? You absolutely are. So ignorance is no excuse. So as far as contract, when you're billing to an insurance company, documentation needs to support the medical necessity for that service you're, you're providing. If it does not, then it can be considered medically unnecessary. And if you're not documented appropriately, for example, in my practice, patient would come and I diagnose a crown. I obviously did not document very well. My business person who submitted that claim would come to me and say, Dr. Shelburne, why is, why is this crown necessary? And I would roll it off and she would write it all down and she would go forward and enter all that into the computer and fire that off to the insurance. And it was paid because it was justified appropriately. However, if you're audited, they will look at your clinical record for that information that was on that claim form. And if it's not in your clinical record, which is your legal document that justifies the need for that crown, if it doesn't exist in that space, then more than likely that insurance company is going to ask for the money back because the legal entity that actually justifies that treatment is in your clinical record, not on the dental claim form. Interesting. Those are just some of the instances where you need to be aware that there are risks and your documentation is very, very instrumental in protecting and defending the practice. That's really interesting. I'm curious, you know, you mentioned all the, the, the different organizations that fall under the government, um, the governmental part of it. Um, I, I'm curious because, um, in my final year or two of, of, of clinical practice, um, I had the, um, the prison system reach out to me and they asked if I would be willing to see prisoners who are now in halfway houses who have been released from prison and are trying to get back to the, back on their feet. That are, and they're having issues and, you know, they, they, they have a negotiated rate. They pay a certain percentage of what my, my, my fees were. And I'm, I was a fee for service practice. So I didn't, I didn't participate with insurance at all. Um, so they asked me to do that. And I did, I did it as I felt it was a good chance for me to give back. And, you know, I, unfortunately, I, 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 I mean, not unfortunately, but I met some very interesting characters, I guess you can call them in, in my time doing it. We probably treated 20 or 30 patients. Um, you know, some were, murderers and I had murderers in my chair, which was kind of a scary thought if you think about it. You know, other ones where they would, a couple were drug dealers, a couple of people, we had someone that, uh, that, um, uh, were, were money laundering and stuff like that. Um, but I guess because I did that, I felt, I fall, I fell under that category that I was get, getting money paid by the government at that point. So that's interesting. I didn't know, I didn't know that. I mean, obviously I've always been very, uh, good at record keeping. Um, I like to tell a story and prior to I was telling you when I read re records, I wanted to know why the patient came in, what you did, you know, what you used and, and what the end result was. That's the, you should, re you should be able to know almost like you were there or watching it from above. That's the way I look at records. So I've never had a problem with record keeping, but that's really interesting to know. That's a really interesting point. You're preaching my message. It should be a story beginning, middle and end. And when you do audits in your practice, a lot of offices think, Oh, we need to keep this clinical. No. The people who are unclinical, non-clinical are the best to review that because if they don't understand, then you have not documented appropriately. If they don't know the where, the when, the why, if there are anything left open to interpretation, that leaves you open to risk because, for example, a malpractice case, if you have a clinical record that is pristine, establishes everything, because first thing, if a patient complains to an attorney, the attorney is going to ask for what? the clinical records of the patient. And if that attorney gets that clinical record and it is indisputable, they will not go forward. It's hard to make a case when there's that much ju justification, when there's that much foundation. However, if you see a record that has multiple holes in it, the attorney's going to go after you because you're going to have to try to defend yourself after the fact, and that never works. But your clinical record, if it's established, that will testify for you and lays a foundation and will protect you. 
Great point. And one of the things I'll also say, and this is just, uh, we talked about this briefly, was that if you're not using a computer system, which I, I think it's crazy if you're not at this point in your, in, in the world, I guess you can call it, um, make sure your handwriting is legible because there's so many people that I can't read what is going on. I, I, it's like chicken scratch to me. Um, and I'm sure that's something that you're, you're very big on as well. Yeah. I did an audit for, uh, practice in Maryland. And there was a hygienist. I, I opened the clinical record for that patient, and I literally could not read a single word the hygienist had um, noted. And I, you know, debriefed at the end of the day, and I had a sit down with the hygienist, and I, I gave him one of his records. It was from a year and a half ago. And I asked, what does this say? And he looked, I said, I'm, I, I can't read and it. he wrote it. <laughs> he wrote it and couldn't read it. I'm like, you might as well not have done any of this. You know, you could have gone out and had a snack or something rather than record this because it doesn't help you at all. That's really interesting. So obviously we're talking about documentation and documentation is, is of critical, critical importance to maximize reimbursement and minimize risk when it comes to obviously even insurance companies to some extent, not even government agencies. So, um, I know you obviously work with offices to, to really hit that point. So can you talk a little bit about, um, some other things related to the documentation here? Sure. A completely filled out document, documentation, clinical record will give that billing person the tools they need to to maximize reimbursement because most offices are now seeing a trend that changes. They're not looking for information in either remarks section or some addendum that the dentist is or the practice is sending to justify the need for treatment. They're literally asking for copies of that documentation from the clinical record. And if you do a screenshot and fire that off, believe me, that will move you much higher in the possibility of getting reimbursed than if you try to make up something and put it in an attachment to that claim to the insurance carrier. And by the way, a lot of people don't know this. If you're typing the Great American Novel into the remarks section on, a, on an insurance claim form, if you're electronic, and as you mentioned, Lynn, electronic records as well as electronic transfers, use leverage your software to its very maximum. But if you're typing the Great American Novel in the remarks section, only 80 characters get transferred to the insurance company. That's not 80 words, that's 80 characters. So if you're typing this huge narrative and you only get to the justification after the 80th character, the insurance company's not seeing that. They will deny that claim because they don't have the documentation they need. So that needs to go on. I would, like I said, if your doctor does a good job of documenting, and I say doctor, but the entire team needs to be involved in the process because actually all of you have skin in the game. But if you do a screenshot or if you do a copy and paste, that's the best way to be able to justify that need for treatment because that person, it's it's a dentist who determines need based on um, medical necessity, if you give them the information they need, it's the greater likelihood that they're going to go ahead and approve that rather than wondering, you know, they type this up and there's there's not a whole lot of information here. I wonder why they really needed to do that. So yeah, there's their documentation is going to be a foundation for that to get you paid. Number two, as we talked before, it's going to protect and defend you. And number three, if there is a board issue, and we talked about this earlier, sometimes the board person will look at that and ding the dentist based on the fact that their clinical records do not meet standard of care. And every state requires that the dentist sign the clinical records. The number of times I've gone into an office and done an audit to find that the dentist has not signed the clinical record, and even if they sign their own, they don't sign the hygienist. Hygienists can only practice independently in five states, and they have to be—they um, have to have a um, notification from the board that they can practice independently and diagnose. So, if a hygienist cannot practice and diagnose separately, the doctor is responsible for that. So, the doctor actually has to sign the record for the hygienist. Is, and I'm curious about that because that triggered a, a thought. When you say sign the record, is—is is that putting initials, or they actually have to? There, there's something within Dentrix that will will sign it, and actually, at that point, it's I think I think after you sign it, you can't edit it anymore. I think that's the way it works. So you can set your software to lock at any particular time. Hopefully, when it's signed, that's when the software is set to lock. But the question as to how you do that, it depends on office protocol. There, it's 
if you establish a written protocol in your practice, when the doctor's full name is, is typed in after the clinical notation, that in our office is established as a signature for that claim. So do you have to spend the money for the pad to be able to do that? You don't, but you have to establish in writing what is a signature in your practice, which everybody in the, in the team needs to know. So everybody needs to read that policy and sign it, that they understand that they type in the doctor's name only and if the doctor has reviewed and approved what's written there. If we set up, and I'm, again, I'm not clinical much anymore, but if we had set up that a, a, uh, an initials was, would constitute a signature, is, does that qualify or are you, you literally have to type the name in full? There could be problems with initials, um, being that there are a possibility that there could be multiple initials, the same initials in the practice. So that even though this year you were the only doctor, two years after there came another doctor that had same initials. So initials can be problematic. I recommend typing. I don't think I've ever name. typed my name into it. I've always put my initials when I wrote notes. Um, that's interesting to, yeah. uh, interesting to note. I, I had no, I just learned something new here. Um, now you, you talked about, yeah, yeah. um, team and how important, obviously a team is important to running a business. You have to have the, a great team to be a, a great office. Um, but you also said that everybody has skin in the game. So, um, I'm curious if you have a, um, if you have an employee who is, is not, following protocols is the dentist ultimately still responsible for what their employees do when it comes to these types of cases can the employee get into trouble as we'll talk about talk about the team the team aspect now yeah um as far as if that team member is not meeting a standard of care yes doctor's responsible for making sure that everything that happens in the office meets the standard and if you are charged with racketeering and money laundering and in most cases in today's world if there is an action and insurance companies will take action against dentists the money needs to make sense for them so if it's a huge number Will they take criminal action against the dentist? They will. And as far as the racketeering and money laundering, those by definition are a team of individuals or group of individuals who scheme to have reimbursement that they're not entitled to. So everybody can be named in an action. The de dentist always will be, but team members can be as well because you have skin in the game and has there been actions against practices that did name team members? The answer to that absolutely is. And as an aside, a different issue is that everybody on the team will generally have a conversation with a pa patient that has some basis on their dental um, health, their histories, and there is a reasonable expectation that that person who was told that information conveys that to the doctor. So, for example, patient calls into the practice and they, they disclose a chief complaint. That person at the front desk should be trained to be able to enter that chief complaint into the clinical record because that's something that needs to be part of the clinical record. If a patient misses appointments, um, cancels appointments, they're non, they're non-compliant. Will non-compliance have an ultimate result on the success or failure of the work that we provide for the patient? The answer to that is yes. And that needs to be in the clinical record. For example, there's an action against the dentist, a malpractice action. And the doctor says, well, one of the reasons why this failed is because they missed seven appointments. They delayed treatment for six months. They, they had endodontics. The endodontic opening came. There was a leakage. And if they don't document that in the clinical record, which we've established, that is the legal document that does give the history for the patient. The doctor could say the patient was non-compliant. The patient said, I came to every appointment, never missed an appointment. I did everything the doctor said. Who will the jury believe, the patient or the doctor? The jury is made up of our patients. They will side with the patient almost every time. So um, there are things that are disclosed to the doctor that and as well as the team that need to be part of the clinical record. So all of us have skin in the game because you can be named in the action. And number two, there is a reasonable expectation that when you're told something, that it will be conveyed to the doctor. And if that's not, and the doctor does something not knowing what the patient has disclosed, then there could be an issue to that with, with that as well. Now, I know that we had already made a point that you're not taught this stuff in dental school. Obviously, I'm learning things that I, you know, I was practicing dentistry for 22 years that obviously I was, I was not doing the right way. I don't want to say incorrectly. I was not doing the right way though. Um, how does 
somebody learn about the proper way to document because a lot of this stuff is news. I, I guarantee, and I think you made a point, I think before we started that you had raised, you asked a question in the, in the, um, in your, um, your seminar, how many people have had this happen to them or how many people are doing this? And only three people raised their hand and this because they went through a problem like that. So, um, how does, how does people learn the proper way to document and, and make sure they're, they're up to the, the, the levels that need to be to protect them? You have multiple ways to be able to do that. Just like HIPAA and OSHA. Is there information on the web? Yes. Is it limited to some degree? And, you know, if you are part of the Facebook groups, you look at that and people will ask questions and the number of erroneous or incorrect answers, it blows my mind. It's no, that is fraudulent. You can't do that. Um, so in terms of a reputable person to be able to attend one of those seminars, go to, there are classes to be able to go to that. Um, and this is shameless self-promotion, but we have a, uh, Delane Galegi and I, she's a colleague, have a two day book boot camp in Charlotte, um, uh, in November 18th and 19th, which will give you the soup to nuts to be able to learn these issues to protect and defend your practices. So it's a matter of, of studying just like, HIPAA and OSHA, you, you know, you do what you need to, to be able to learn. Are there outside sources? There absolutely are. As far as documentation, the, if you're part of the American Dental Association, there's some documentation supports and helps in that area as well. Um, just like I said, dig, dig, dig till you get and use a reputable source. I would not suggest that you go to the, the, your Facebook page and ask the question. Unless the answer is from c- coming from somebody that you know and are reputable, somebody who is um, recognized by the American Dental Association, or as we said, the uh, Dental Management Consultant Group, we we vet those individuals who come in, so we know that they know what they're doing. So those are ways to be able to do that. It, very enlightening. Um, I will grab your ways for people to get contact information from you in a little bit. I, I want to uh, switch gears now, um, and I want to go to the section of the podcast that I like, which is called uh, Poddex. For those that are, are frequent viewers and listeners of it know, I basically asked some lightning round Q&A to the, to the guest, a little bit different perspective on things. Um, so this is the deck I like to call the hustle. It's all about business stuff. Um, so uh, Roy, uh, to begin with, and just, you know, answer them these as quickly as possible so we can get through eight to 10 of these. Um, so the first one, which I, um, I mentioned to you was, have you ever turned down a client and why? Absolutely. It's not a good fit. Uh, some clients want to learn how to get around things. And that's something that I get questions. How do I get, get around this? How do I not have to do this? And you can't, you have to, you have to do it the right way. There's no way to skirt it. There's no way to be able to twist it. So it, do it the right way. And they, if they don't, if they don't agree with that, I, it's not a good fit. Gotcha. Um, interesting question here. Who do you look to for advice or mentorship? Dr. Charles Blair was a great mentor of mine. Um, he was a great guru as far as the billing and coding. So I became a writer for him. I've helped to edit his books and have worked with him for a number of years. As far as speakers, Linda Miles was one of those individuals who, in fact, made it possible for me to go to the speaking consulting. You and I are both members, Lynn. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but the day I was released from prison, she arranged for me to fly from home, and it was in Anaheim, California that year, to go to that meeting, and it was it was life changing. So both Dr. Charles Blair and Linda Miles are are they are incredible speakers, incredible people. So those are great people. Perfect. Do you have a system in place to keep yourself organized? If if you do, what is it? It's my calendar. Um, I I use it, color code it. Um, give myself to do's every single day. I, and it's, it drives my life. Uh, and it also helps my wife understand where I am and what I'm doing. <laughs> what have you learned from the most successful person you know? The most successful person, and I'm going to do this not business wise and personal wise. Um, it was my grandfather. And the thing he taught me was to forgive yourself learn from your mistakes. And that literally got me through after having been convicted, spending time in federal prison, there was a great possibility of me never forgiving myself. And were there things that affected my family? There were, there were horrible. Absolutely. They were in the middle of all this with me. And 
before you can move forward, you have to accept what happened, forgive yourself, learn from it, move forward. This is a little different take on things. If you could take a class to learn anything you wanted, what would it be? Foreign language, probably Spanish. I took Spanish in high school and college and can't speak it now, and I'm intrigued. I'd love to be able to... Communication is very important, and I'd love to be able to communicate in a different language. I speak, Another interesting question. I speak English yeah. and Appalachian American, so you're, you're, getting, the, <laughs> you're getting the English today. <laughs> um, who has been your greatest inspiration? Oh, that's a great question. My son. Um, son graduated from dental school in May when I surrendered my license in July and went to prison in um, August. He came into my practice and made it work in a very difficult and trying situation. And only complaint has ever been that he's too busy. While I was in prison, he paid my wife's mortgage so she could have a house over a roof over her head and supported his two sisters. So he's, he's the man I would always want to be. That's great. Um, if you achieved all of your life goals tomorrow, what would you do next? Bring my family together and celebrate. Go on a cruise <laughs> or Disney World. With, with, with my family. And last but not least, I think this is a good way to, to end these questions is what do you think will be your legacy? That he, more than anybody else, loved people, loved what he did, and loved those people that he worked with. That's great. Well, thank you for taking part in that. I appreciate that. Oh, uh, great pleasure. To begin with, how can people get information about the course you're giving? And then if they have any questions or want to reach out to you, how do they get information or what information do you want to provide for them to do that? Oh, thanks for asking. As far as the course, if they want to either email or text me, I'll send them a flyer that they can review. If something that fits, we'd love to love to have them. It's going to be in North Carolina at the Nash Institute. Um, my email is ROI underscore S H E L B U R N E at hotmail.com. Um, texting or emailing are probably the best. Lynn, as you mentioned, I, uh, I speak, write and consult on the road a lot. So I may be in a plane or can't answer my phone, even though I'd like to, those are the best ways. And the, the class in North Carolina is limited, so um, if you, you know, want to want to do that, or if you just want to reach out and say, "Hey, I'd be interested in your next one," if it's not a good fit for you, love to be able to make up that list and give you first dibs at the next one. Perfect. Well, this was great. Um, very interesting information. Uh, it was great to learn more about your story, um, guys. If you have a chance to see Roy speak uh, at the next meeting that you go to, make sure you do that. He he gives an amazing class and makes you really re reflect on your career and. And, uh, think, uh, that you're, um, that he is, was fortunate to, to come out, you know, where he is and still be able to, um, not, not really do much dentistry or not doing dentistry anymore, but he's able to give back to the, to the, to our, to the, to his colleagues, uh, by teaching them how to avoid the, um, the issues that he encountered in, in his, in his practice. Um, but this was great, Roy. If guys, if you like the episode, uh, please subscribe, please share, please review us. Um, you can go to iTunes and click review. It's really important. Um, but um, subscribe is even more important. Uh, we, we're getting a ton of subscribers. Um, Roy, I appreciate you, you know, spending the time with me to enlighten the audience, the listeners and the viewers. Um, and as I always end these podcasts, remember, your reputation matters. Until the next episode, Roy, thanks again for joining me. And we'll talk to everyone soon.